So uh, the title of this series of lectures is Additive Combinatorics Methods in Fractal Geometry. So far I haven't said anything about additive combinatorics, so that will be the topic of today's talk. So today's talk is almost independent of the previous talk, so if you are lost, then this is your chance to come back in. <laughs> so um, yeah, so the, the, the proof of the main result that I have been discussing in the previous lectures is very much based on additive combinatorics. So I will explain the, some of the tools that are behind it, but unfortunately I won't be able to explain uh, why these tools are behind it. So you can read the paper for that. Okay, so, um, so raise your hand if you are familiar with the Balog semiridi gowers theorem. <laughs> Balog semiridi gowers Okay, two people, great, because this is the, somehow the main, main, will be the main topic of today's talk. So it's a theorem which is uh, uh, quite unbelievable. Okay, so um, before that, let's review for the last time the main result. So uh, it involves this notion of LQ dimension, so uh, I recall the definition that I gave at the end of yesterday's talk. So we have these moment sums, so we look at the LQ norm of these discrete measures. These are dyadic cubes or intervals in the, well, in RD, cubes of side length two to the minus n. I look at the moment sum and I look uh, how they uh, decrease, this will go to zero, how they decrease as the um, size of the mesh goes to zero, so n goes to infinity, and then I normalize so that I get a number between zero and d in the end, so that this will be a notion of reasonable notion of dimension of a measure, which depends on q. So it's a one parameter family of dimensions, LQ dimensions, they are very popular, in particular uh, in multifractal analysis, it's a key component, component of multifractal analysis, and as a function of q, uh, this uh, is decreasing, but could be constant, it is not increasing, and it tends to the Frostman exponent as Q tends to infinity, because when Q is large, this is picking up the mass of the, so, it's, so if, Q, if Q is large, this is concentrated on those few cubes which have larger mass than the others. Okay, and uh, this is the LQ version of the main result. Uh, we have a model, so this was a group, this was a minimal translation on the group, this was a contraction parameter between zero and one, and this was a function that for each element of the group gives you a finitely supported atomic measure. Then we have this number, which is a natural number for this problem, which involves the LQ norms of these atomic measures, which are defined by, in the sort of obvious way, but the point is there is no normalization, so this is just the sum of the masses to the Q, Q root, but actually there is a power Q here, and then the conclusion is that we have a formula for the LQ dimension of these dynamical self-similar measures, which is valid for every element of the group. Every element of the group. Not almost all, but all. This is somehow the key point. Actually, for almost all, this is also new if Q is larger than two. If, well, it is new also if Q is smaller than two. Uh, but somehow, uh, the, so previous methods could be pushed to prove this for Q between one and two. But because there is mass transfer projection theorem for Q up to two, but not, not beyond two. So the main, the main new thing is for Q bigger than two. And in particular for arbitrary large Q. Yes? So the, the delta y should be delta of x of y. Right, yeah, so delta of x, all of this is an atomic measure. So the LQ norm of delta of x, so delta of x has some atoms, and for each atom you raise the mass to the Q and add over all atoms of delta of x. Okay, so unfortunately the proof is quite long, so I won't be able to say much, but let me just mention some uh, keywords. Well, the proof is decided with combinatorics, uh, as I've just said, and in the rest of the talk I will describe some of the uh, tools that come into this part. Then uh, there is a little bit of dynamics, not too much, but so the, we have this, this group translation, and this group translation is uniquely ergodic, and so this is what is really used, so it has a lot of rigidity, and somehow this allows us to say that all of the measures mu x are pretty much the same for every x in the group. So I wanted to say something about this part in yesterday's talk, so I didn't have time, but the slides are not yet on the website, but when they are, you can read, uh, well, so there is a subjective cost cycle. So basically what is used is, of course, everybody knows that if you have a uniquely ergodic transformation, then ergodic averages of continuous functions converge uniformly. In this case, there is a subadditive cost cycle instead of additive. So there is a one-sided version of that that is, is also true for subadditive cycles, and this is what is used. 
Okay, uh, then there is something about multifractal analysis uh, that I'm not going, going to go into, but it's, it's expected because uh, the result is about LQ dimensions, so, okay. And somehow all of these, okay, uh, not all of these, but, uh, but part of these, uh, so basically one and three, well, actually, no, just one. Okay, never mind. So, <laughs> so the proof is quite long, but it has several steps, and somehow, so the main steps, uh, they follow the scheme of a result of Mike Kaufman that I think, but, well, I, I sort of talked about this result several, or this paper at least several times, and Peter Vario will actually tell you more about uh, this Mike Kaufman's framework. Yeah, so, the, the, so if you look at the proof on far away, it looks very much like I, Mike Kaufman's proof. But the proof of each of the steps is quite different, or at least the proof of some of the steps is quite different. So basically, he used entropy and I'm using LQ norms. So, uh, yeah, it is different, or maybe not so different. Okay, so, so here's a question which is extremely natural, uh, and, well, uh, so it's a vague question, so there are infinitely many questions that implement this question in a precise way, and uh, these sort of questions are very important and very useful and very natural. So. Smooth, uh, convolution is a smoothing operator, so in particular we have two measures, we convolve them, we expect to have a measure which is smoother than the original measures. And the question is how much smooth, smoother and how does this relate to the structure of the measures? So it's a general question. Uh, it's not clear to what field this question belongs. One could say to, uh, well, I don't know. but. Okay, so first of all, what does it mean for a measure to be smooth? Well, one can measure smoothness in many different ways. So, for example, using entropy, so entropy is one way, and so this question where smoothness is measured by entropy uh, is behind uh, Mike Kochman's result and Peter Varius results as well, so I think Peter is going to tell you more about some, at least some of these, uh, some versions of this question where smoothness is measured with entropy, but in the applications to fractal geometry, and so the content of my talk today and uh, Peter Varius' talk, so basically you are in a discrete situation. So either the measure lives in some discrete space, or maybe the measure lives on RD, but uh, we look at the measure at a given finite scale delta. So it is a quite combinatorial uh, question. So that's why it has been studied, so the tools or the ideas come from combinatorics. Okay, so, um, so now, uh, so we're going uh, much more in the direction of combinatorics. So suppose we have a group G, and we have a abelian group G, abelian group G, and we have a subset of, of a finite subset of the group, and we look at the size of the sum set. So this is the arithmetic sum. So this means all of the sums x plus y, where x and y are in A, arithmetic sum. Okay, so certainly this contains a tra many translates, at least one, so A is not empty, so uh, this inequality is trivial, and this inequality is also trivial. The group is civilian, that's why we have this factor one half. So to first order, the size of A plus A varies between the size of A and the size of A squared. Or if we are in a finite group, it could be that, well, the group, the size of the group is a better bound on this, but uh, let's ignore this. Okay, so if the size of A plus A is not much bigger than the size of A, we think that A has additive structure, or whatever this means. So this is actually a definition of having addi additive structure, one possible definition. So A plus A is not much bigger than A. So, well, this, of course, is true if A itself is a group. It's a subgroup of G. But somehow the point of additive combinatorics is that it is very interesting to consider the case where these two numbers are not equal, but they are comparable in some sense. So this gives rise to a very rich structure, uh, theory. Theory. Okay, so let me give some examples of sets with additive structure in, the, in this sense. Well, okay, so the first trivial example I already mentioned is for a subgroup, we have exactly the same size. So, um, but suppose that our group doesn't have subgroups, uh, which is actually a very common situation. So, uh, what comes very close to a subgroup is an arithmetic progression, so a long arithmetic progression. So, if you have a long arithmetic progression and you add it to itself, well, we double the size, but if A is very large, doubling the size is almost making no change. So, um, yeah, so this is the simplest example. The next step is a generalization of arithmetic progressions. Uh, so a gap is a generalized arithmetic progression. So what is a generalized arithmetic progression? This is like an arithmetic progression, but it's a, instead of having one gap size, we have D gap sizes. So this is like a projection of a discrete parallelepiped. So these are the sides of the parallel pipe, and, the, and these are the uh, uh, sides, the lengths of the sides of the parallel pipe. So this is a generalized arithmetic progression, and D is the rank. So if we assume that D is given, so if D is one, it is a real arithmetic progression. So if D is given, 
Again, uh, these sets have small subset because uh, it grows by at most a factor of two to the d. Actually, this is if it is proper. So proper means uh, that all of these sums are different. So all of these representations are different, which doesn't have to be the case even if the group has no torsion. Okay, and so this is actually very, very important. So if we take one of the previous examples, and now we take a very large subset, this is still true, because if A is a dense subset of a progression, for example, A plus A is still a dense subset of, of, the, of the longer progression, so we still have this. So having a small subset is robust under passing to large subsets in general. So um, let's now th uh, see some examples of the opposite behavior. So having a maximal subset or having absolutely no additive structure at all. Well, if, if you take a random set, just pick some elements at random, you don't expect to have, uh, yeah, you expect to, the same set to be very large. Another deterministic sum is, is a lacunary set. If you look at powers of two, then all, all of the sums are different. So these are called Sidon sets. And so a more interesting example is, we pick one of the examples from here and another one of the examples from here of the same size and take the union. And this again has a very large sum set because, of the, because the random part has a very large sum set. So if you have a set which is a combination of a very structured part and a very unstructured part and look at the sum set, the unstructured part wins. It, it, so you cannot see the structured part in the size of the sum set. So this is important for understanding why Balogh's and Merdeka words is magical in some sense. Okay, so, um, so this theorem is actually not used in the proof of first numerous conjecture, so I'm going to go over it quickly, but I wanted to mention it and I wanted to explain why it is somehow useless uh, for what we want to do. Okay, so, it, but it is a beautiful theorem. It's really beautiful, so it's a classical theorem. So suppose that you have a set which is a very small sum set. So the size of the sum is at most k times the size of the set, and we assume that k is given. K is a given number, and the size of a is arbitrarily large, with the, but k is fixed. Then actually, a is a, is a dense subset of a generalized arithmetic progression. So there are no other examples of sets which are small sum set other than the ones that we already saw in the previous slide. These are the only ones. This is what Feynman's theorem is telling us. So it's quite amazing. So in the original version, uh, the rank of the progression and how densely embedded the progression, sorry, uh, yes, how densely embedded the set is in the progression, these are numbers that depend on k in a horrible way. In the original proof of uh, Feynman, and it is a very important uh, topic even today to get better quantitative bounds, to get quantitative bounds. So there are quantitative bounds, but uh, the sharp bounds are not known. So this is an important open problem in analytic combinatorics. So, yeah, so here is an example of uh, some, so these are much more recent results. Uh, I, I'm not sure this is still the current world record because I copied and pasted this from a course that I gave two years ago. So maybe there are news, but at least two years ago, these were the world records. So the rank is polynomial, polynomial in the doubling constant, uh, but the density of the set is not. It's, it's still like a double exponential. So this is still quite bad if you want to apply this in the kind of pr problem. So for my application somehow, this is what kills using Feynman's theorem directly. If you're extremely smart, for example, if you are Burgan, then he was able, even with his very bad quantitative dependence, to do uh, amazing things. But I'm not as smart, so I could not use this. Okay, so the conjecture is that in fact here one can have something polynomial in K. But I think this is a, I'm not an expert in this, but I think this is a hard open problem. Okay, so in my situation, so in my situation is more, it's more complicated than this, but basically the problem is that K grows with A. So in my situation, I'm interested in this, something like this. A bit more complicated, but something of this type. So here the constant is the size of A to the delta. So it grows with A as a power. And then these quantitative estimates become completely worthless. So it, uh, Feynman's theorem says absolutely nothing in this case. So we will need something else. Okay, so now I will define another notion that also allows us to measure the additive structure of sets in a slightly different way. So now we have two sets, A and B, which are subset of a common abelian group, and we look at additive quadruples. So we look at all quadruples, that's, so, two points in A, two points in B, so that the sums are equal. So this is a definition of additive energy, and again, it measures additive structure because we are looking how many coincidences are when we are the point of A and a point of B. So 
Well, the diagonal is certainly there, so I'm allowing uh, x1 to be equal to x2 and y1 to be equal to y2, so if you count the diagonal, we see that this is at least the product of the sizes of a and b. So it's trivial lower bound, and there is also a trivial upper bound because once x1, y1, and x2 are given, there is only one possibility for y2. So that means that the, the additive energy is at most the size of a squared times the size of b, and of course the same with uh, switching a and b. So in particular, if a is equal to b, so now let's think about the case where a is equal to b, the additive energy ranges from the size of a squared to the size of a cubed. And yes, so the case of having additive structure, so a set has additive structure when we are close to this, to this uh, end of the range, because it means that there are many coincidences when we add two numbers. There are many coincidences. If there are few coincidences, then we will be closer to the lower bound. Can you draw a picture of A and B and sort of what the energy is measuring? I, I've never seen energy before. Well, uh, I, I will give an alternative characterization as the L2 norm of the convolution. I don't know if that is better for you. No, but I mean, we can't see these trivial bounds if we don't have a chance to actually understand what the energy is. Like, well, I, I'm, I'm happy to explain again the trivial bounds, but I'm, I'm not sure I can draw a picture. Why not? <laughs> Okay, so, well, okay, I, I will draw a picture. So Amy wants a picture, so I'll draw a picture, so. Right, so let's say we have A and B, and then we look at the projection in this direction, so that we have A plus B here. And now we look at the point which is in the projection, and we look at the fiber. So we look at points in A times B, which project to, to, to Z, and then, we, what we add is we add uh, the sizes of the fiber squared. Because, so points in the fiber are points in A times B which project to the same Z. So if we want to count the pairs, we have to square the size of the fiber. <coughs> size of the fiber squared over the fibers. Yeah, actually, I was going to mention this, but without the picture. <laughs> yes, but that was. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, um, okay. Okay, great. So, um, so here is a more analytic uh, interpretation of additive energy. So, uh, given A, I consider the function or the measure, whatever measure, I guess, indicator is just the sum of delta masses at points in A. So here I'm breaking my convention that all measures are probability measures. These measures are not probability measures. I'm not normalizing by anything. It's just the sum of the delta atoms. And then the energy is uh, actually the L2 norm squared of the convolution of these indicator functions of A and B, and this is the proof. So. What is the convolution at the point Z is, well, this is the definition. This is just a definition. So it's, you have to count how many pairs coming from A and B have some set equal to this number Z. That's the, convol the convolution evaluated at Z. And the additive energy, is, it is this. So this is the size of the fiber corresponding to, so this is wrong, this should be equal to Z. I thought I had fixed this. Maybe I fixed it here, but not here. Anyway, so this should be equal to Z. And then I add, uh, so yeah, so this is, yeah, and then I add overall possible results, and well, then by this, this is this. In this case, it is completely obvious from the picture, once you draw that picture. Okay, yeah. okay, great. Great that I drew the picture then. Okay, so uh, yeah, so it, it, is, it, is a, it is a convolution. So this is why this fits into the general problem, general problem that I mentioned earlier about what can we say, so under what conditions, you convolve to measures and the result, it is much smoother or it is not much smoother than the original measures. So here is an example. So when does this, so okay, so yeah, so let me give some examples and then I will go back to the problem of seeing when there is smoothing under convolution. Okay, so some examples of uh, sets which have structure from this other point of view, which I will explain is not the previous point of view of having very large additive energy. Well, first, arithmetic progressions and general arithmetic progressions, they have very large additive energy because there are many coincidences when you sum. So you, you can check that this is true. 
So these examples have additive energy from both points of view. Small subset and large additive energy, and if you, if you take a dense subset, this is still true. So, so far, it is the same as before. But here is where there is a very crucial difference. So this is very important. This is the most important thing I'm going to say today because it explains why the value of the Gauer sphere is non-trivial. So take a union of two, two sets, this joint union of two sets of roughly the same size, where one is random, one is random, and the other one is one of these examples. If we look at the sum set, as I explained, the random set overwhelms the other set, and you only see the randomness. But when looking at additive energy, it's the opposite. It's the opposite, because now you're counting additive quadruples. So if one set has few additive quadruples, the one which the set which has many additive quadruples will win. So if you take the union of a random set and a structure set, the sum set sees the random set, but the additive energy sees the structure set. So in this sense, they are very different. And another, so it is basically the same, but uh, another way of seeing why these two concepts of additive structure cannot be the same concept is that both additive energy and, small, and the size of the sum set, they are both monotone functions of the set. If you have a larger set, all these numbers go up. Can, yes. A cubed. So having additive structure is a cubed. It means you, that you that the set has few fibers with many elements. So the way to make the sum of the squares big is by having few which are big. And this means, well, here you sort of see the connection to the sum set because so there is a fiber for each element of the sum set. So there's a points in the sum set because it's. Um... The sum set has. Okay, so yeah, there is, a connection, there is a connection that I'm going to explain in the next slide between these two things. But what I'm saying here is, from the point of view of the sum set, additive structure means small sum set. And from the point of view of additive energy, additive structure is large additive energy. But these both concepts are monotone in the same direction. So somehow they, are, they, go in, they go in opposite ways. So they cannot be the same concept in a very fundamental way. Okay, so um, so there is so there is a relation in, in, in one direction. So if a set has small sum set, it necessarily has large energy. So going back to the picture, uh, so if there are few fibers, the fibers have to be large because all, all of the product set a times me lies in some fiber. So if there are few fibers, they have to be large on average. So that's not how the proof. But I, I will give a more detailed proof. So this is the quantitative relationship. So this means that if the sum set is, has ra size roughly a, the additive energy has size roughly a, a cubed. So small sum set implies uh, large energy. And it's Cauchy Schwartz. So it, it is why I, I just say looking at the picture. So every point in the product set lies in some fiber, and then we just apply Cauchy Schwartz. So it is Cauchy Schwartz. So as everybody knows, Cauchy-Schwarz goes in one direction, the, it doesn't go in the opposite direction, it, it fails. So, Balogs and Meredith-Gowers tells us that in this context, you can reverse Cauchy-Schwarz. You have to pay a price, but the price that you have to pay is not so big. So it's, it's quite unbelievable, see, if you think of it in this way. Okay, so, um, so, Additive energy comes up in many, many, many situations. Believe me, it arises all over the place. It's a very, something very natural. But somehow, uh, it's, it is easier to look at the more combinatorial problem of looking at the size of the sum set. For example, Freiman's theorem is a theorem that tells you that if the sum set is small, something, you, you get a lot of structure out of that. But sometimes, one has to deal with the additive energy, not with the size of the sum set. And unfortunately, it doesn't go in, so the, the, it is the other, the other direction which, which is true. The direction we want is not true. We saw that it is not true. Okay, so this is what I started to say a few minutes earlier, so it is written here. So, okay, so we, we have this Young's inequality, which for finitely supported functions, this is just a convexity of x to the q. It's just a definition of convexity. There is absolutely nothing here. Okay, so in the case where f and g are indicator functions of the same set, so these are the norms. So if the additive energy is large, looking at the additive energy as the L2 norm of reconvolution, is saying that there is almost no uh, increase of smoothness. So smaller L2 norms means more smooth. Big L2 norms means large peaks, non-smooth. So smaller L2 norms, smooth. So you expect the convolution to have smaller L2 norms. 
But if you're combined with the indicator function of A and itself, and you're in the range when the additive energy is almost maximal, another way of thinking about this, which is related to the general question I posed uh, earlier, it says that in this case, there is almost no gain in smoothness. So for a set of with a large additive energy, there is almost no gain in smoothness when you, com so it is equivalent to say that there is almost no gain in L2 smoothness when you convolve the indicator of A with itself. So uh, we have seen that this happens, so if you start with a set of small doubling, and then you take the union with anything else, a random set which could be absolutely anything, of more or less comparable size. So the question is, are there any, are there any other examples of sets which very large additive energy? And we would like to understand this because it will give an answer to, in one specific instance, to the question I asked at the beginning. So what, in what context there is no gain in smoothness measured by L2 norm in this case when you convolve? And the value of the Gower theorem, what tells us is that there are no other examples. These are the other examples, the, the only examples. In a quite strong quantitative way, these are the only examples. So if you have a set with very large additive energy with no gain in smoothness, then it contains a subset which is very large, which has very small doubling constant. So whose subset is very small. This is exactly the content of the theorem of Alex and Gower. So here it is uh, in a bit more precise way. So first of all, so why, why, why is it called Valoc and Gower? So Valoc and Semeredi proved a version, a non-quantitative version, using Semeredi's regularity lemma which it, it is the tool that Samaridi introduced to prove his famous uh, theorem on arithmetic progressions in the subsets. And then Gowers proved a quantitative version very similar to this in his paper about quantitative versions of Samaridi's theorem for progressions of length four. That's why it's called Balux Samaridi Gowers. And it should be called the Balux Samaridi Gowers Burgan, because Burgan, uh, well, we will see in the next slide that found many amazing applications of this and also found, found many refinements and extensions that pe so people use. Little c and big c don't depend on k. They don't depend on k. They are, they are universal constants which are completely explicit. They are two to the 10 or something like this. They are not even that large. They are completely explicit constants, completely explicit. Right, so we have a set which has large additive energy in the sense that it is within a factor k of the maximum possible additive energy. So there is a subset which is very large. It has density one over k up to a universal constant. And the subset of this set is very small. Well, here there is a power of four, but it is polynomial. So unlike, unlike Feynman's theorem, it is polynomial. Are things in the wrong, is there anything wrong? What is k? Arbitrary. K, arbitrary number, it's an arbitrary number. It's an arbitrary number. So this, this, this is meaningful even if k grows with a which was not the case for Feynman's theorem. This is meaningful even if k grows with a. So if k is the size of a to the epsilon, which is the case I'm interested in, this gives you information. Very useful information, in fact. Okay, so just to convince you that this theorem is quite amazing, I'm going to show you some applications of the theorem, and some of them are actually dynamical, or at least they are ergodic theory applications. And they are all somehow related to each other, but I will show them separately so I can impress you more. So maybe the most uh, famous or uh, amazing application is the uh, burgan gambur expansion machinery. So okay, let, let me say why, let me say why. So it's very, very natural. So you want to prove equidistribution, so this is used to prove quantitative equidistribution or non-quantitative, some, some kind of equidistribution. And this is very natural because, so you have, a, what is equidistribution? We, you start with the distribution given by a measure mu, and then you have to show that the convolution powers converge to some measure. So, if you, so if, if you have a random walk starting from a given distribution and you want to show that it converges to some measure, some distribution on the space, you have to show that the convolution power of the original distribution converges to the final, final distribution. And well, if you, want to, if you want the random walks to spread out, it is very natural to show that the convolution powers have smaller and smaller L2 norm. So it is quite natural. The value of similarity hours tells you when you know that there will be a uh, decay in the L2 norm. So this is how the reason why this appears in uh, equidistribution problems. So it is really a crucial uh, part in this uh, burgan gambord proof of spectral gaps slash expansions slash quantitative distribution, which are more or less aspects of the same problem. And yeah, this has been a very big development, which I don't know much about. If you have any questions, ask Peter Varyu. Okay, and um, this is somehow related, but it is not the same. So uh, there is a very um, important paper of uh, Burgan, Furman, Lindos, and Moses about equidistribution of 
random products of matrices in LSD, not the, not the, not the, actually the action of that on the torus. And actually today, today on the archive, there is a paper of Wei He generalizing that, that result to a more general setting and looking at the action of products, random products of matrices on the Grassmannian. So maybe this is the closest connection to things that people in this audience could be interested in. So it tells you something about the distribution of random matrix products. Okay, so there is something called some product problem, or there is a variety of some product problems which are important and difficult problems, and in finite fields, and also in the real line for discretized version, the sum product is, uh, sorry, uh, Baluch's and Big Hours theorem is a very important tool. Closely related to these are projection theorems in fractal geometry. Actually, it is the projection theorems that are used in this part. So it goes from this to this, and from this to this. So somehow this is maybe at the base of many of the, of the applications. So yeah, these are not direct applications of Baluch's and Big Hours. These are difficult results. There are many layers, but somehow Baluch's and Big Hours is at the base of all the layers. Okay, uh, estimates about different kinds of exponential sums, actually quite general exponential sums in finite fields and so on. So you can see what all of these applications have in common. It's the, na the name Burgan. So he started all, all of them. Okay, and it is, also, it is also the base of the proof of the main result that I have been discussing in this series of lectures. So again, unfortunately, I won't be able to explain how this comes up in the proof, but believe me, that is sort of the, what makes everything work. Okay, so a um, few more remarks. So. I hope I convinced you that this theorem is quite amazing, but it, it, is, it is magic. So some people like magic and some people don't like magic because they don't understand what's going on. So the proof is surprisingly simple. So of course it's extremely clever. So you, if you see what are Balogs and Meridian Gowers, uh, so yeah, these people do magic, but you, you have to do magic. But uh, once they have done it, it is a trivial counting argument. So the proof is really simple and quite, quite short. And it doesn't use Fourier transform or anything like this. So it's, 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 it's also very strange because it's a, so it's an, it is an analytical statement about L2 norms of convolutions. So it looks like something that would require analysis, Fourier transform, something like this, and it doesn't. It is, a, it is counting graphs on, counting paths on graphs. Okay, so in the version I gave, I, look at the, I looked at the additive energy between A and A. So there is a very similar version where you look at the additive energy between A and B. But in the classical version, the sizes of A and B have to be com comparable, very much comparable, almost the same, almost the same. But actually there is also an asymmetric version. And I was lucky because not many people knew the asymmetric version. Uh, so they didn't use it because they didn't know it. Uh, but actually it is in the book of Tao and Wu, but I think it's a part of the book that nobody read. And Tao and Wu again credit Burgan for the idea. So Burgan proves many things, but he didn't, uh, he didn't state them. So if you didn't read and understand the paper, which is very difficult, you don't know what he proved. Okay, so apparently Burgan proved this asymmetric version and Tao and Wu wrote down the actual statement, which is the one that I use. So I use the asymmetric version. Okay, so, um, great. So I think maybe today I will be even able to finish on time so we can have lunch. Okay, so now, so recall that Feynman theorem works in the regime where the size of A plus A is at most a constant times the size of A. And the constant cannot grow with the size of A. Actually, it can grow, but, but very, very slowly, at most logarithmically. Once it is a power, uh, even a small power, uh, it doesn't give any information whatsoever anymore. So this is the situation I'm interested in. So I, we have a, I have a set which is discretized at scale two to the minus M. So you can, so it doesn't really matter that this group is cyclic. So it could be one up to two to the M, some, something like this. So it's discrete, it's a set that lives in a, in ambient space which has two to the M elements. And the size of the sum set is a small power of the size of the space. It's two to the epsilon N times the size of A. And epsilon is very small, but the point is it is independent of A. It's some very small constant that is given independent of everything. Okay, it's not independent of everything, but anyway, independent of A. So what can we say about A? So we have a set which has this property, what can we say about A? And again, we cannot apply Feynman's theorem, at least we cannot apply Feynman's theorem directly. So Burgan has a paper where he applies Feynman's theorem in a very complicated way at every scale and is able to extract some information, but it's very complicated. And then uh, he has two more proofs on how more or less the same, which are more simple, which are the ones that I was able to understand. Okay, so 
what are trivial cases where this inequality is true? Well, it is inequality true if A is just one point, and it is trivially true if A is the whole space. And okay, it is still true if A is very small, in actually smaller than this number, or if A is very large. If A is within uh, this factor of being everything, then the inequality is also trivially true. So it is trivially true if A is either small or large, or small or large is related to this number, very much related to this doubling constant that we allow. So are there any other examples? Well, the answer is yes, there are other examples. So let me give another example, which is less trivial, but it is a combination of the previous two examples. So at different scales, we either, we take one of the previous two examples. This is what we do. So we construct the set as a tree, as a sort of fractal. So at each stage in the construction of the tree, okay, maybe this, this time I will draw a picture before Amy asks me, asks me to. So we have, we have a base which is true to the t. t is some large number. And then we draw, we draw a tree and associated to the tree, so we think of the tree, it is a tree which is a subset of the two to the t re tree. And if we have a subset of the unit cube or unit interval, we can associate to it the two to the t re tree which, is, which consists of those intervals or cubes, two to the t re intervals of cubes that intersect the set. So we can go between compact subsets of the cube and trees in a standard way. Okay, and then we do the following. So at some scales, we are going to choose everything. So at some, at some stages of the construction, for example, at the first stage in this, in this picture, the, the, the origin, the root of the tree has two to the t descendants. And then at some stages, every vertex will have no descend, one descendant, one descendant. Some descendant it has to have, otherwise the tree dies. One descendant. And maybe in the next stage, again, every vertex has one descendant. And maybe in the next stage, every vertex again has all descendants. Okay, so if, if we have this construction, and okay, we stop, we stop after m prime steps, and m will be m prime times t. So you're creating a tree of degree at most two to the t. Yeah, and at most two to the t. One. And the point is, some vertices have degree one, and some other vertices have degree two to the t. No other options, and at a given at a given level of the tree, it is one of the two. Either all vertices have degree one, or all vertices have degree two to the t. Okay, and if you do this, okay. So when you when you have only degree one, we always choose the leftmost child. We have to choose which child. We, we always choose the same child everywhere at all stages. In the tree? Sorry. Are you now choosing a path? No, I'm saying so. Okay, so we should see. The, uh, we should look at the tree as a subset of the full two to the t re tree. So, so at the stages where we have only one children, so initially we had all children, but we kill all of those except one. So the chosen one will be the primogenic, or what, how is it say in English? First, first child, oldest child, well, whatever, this one. Okay, so if we go back to subsets instead of trees, then uh, what this is saying is that if you look at the two to the TRE expansion of the points in the set, at some, some digits are zero, are forced to be zero. This corresponds to zero digit. And some other digits are free. So if you take the sum set, we have exactly the same structure except that there will be some carries. So when we have an arbitrary digit, we add to itself, we have one carry, but one carry doesn't really change anything because this, this because t is very large. So, the, the, so instead of two to the t once, we have two to the t zeros, we have two to the t plus one. So there is almost no doubling. So yeah, so this is a, a uh, less trivial example of a set with a small subset. In this sense, in this sense. Uh, because, okay, here the epsilon is one over t. So t is arbitrarily large, so epsilon is arbitrarily small. Actually, this set is still a generalized arithmetic progression, but, but the rank is how many scales we have full branching. So the rank can be very large. It is not bounded somehow. So that's maybe the difference with the regime in Feynman's theorem. Okay, so uh, Burgan proved that Somehow, if A plus A is not very large in this exponential sense, then A looks like this. This is the short version, and the long version is more technical, unfortunately, but this is the short version. So in order to get to the long version, so I'm going to define what it means to have a regular set. So given a set, again, we look at the tree induced by the two to the T re intervals hitting the set. And the set is regular if at each level, the number of offspring is the same everywhere in the set. It can change from level to level. So at level S in the tree, every offspring, offspring has exactly RS children. 
So this is also called a spherically symmetric tree. So the number of offspring is independent of where you are in the tree at each level, but can vary from one level to the next. And okay, so and the number of offspring at each level are called R1, first level, R2, second level, and so on. We have n prime levels. So here is a theorem of Burgan. So this is again a theorem that he proved but didn't state. So you actually had to read the paper to see that this is actually uh, hiding in there. So suppose that we have a set with a very small subset. So actually epsilon will depend on two parameters with our delta and t. I'm not completely sure this is the right order of quantifiers, but hopefully it's not too far. Okay, so given delta and t, we can choose epsilon so that this happens. So we have a subset of the two to the minus m times j, numbers of that form in the interval zero one, which has small doubling in this exponential sense. Then I don't know about A, but A contains a subset which is quite dense in A, but quite dense again means in exponential sense. Now everything has exponential sense, which is regular and it has this form, it has this form. So the number of offspring at each stage is either one or almost everything. We cannot ensure that it will be everything. So there are examples where it's not everything because here if instead of everything, we take a large subset of one up to two to the T, the same is true. So in some sense, this is, okay, it is not sharp, but because it is not quantitative. So Burgan has something quantitative, but the quantitative bounds are horrible. Uh, so if you want better quantitative bounds, again, you have to talk to better value. Okay, so, um, okay, so this is the, something that Burgan proved. Questions? How much time do I have? <laughs> Nine minutes, okay, great. I think it would be more than enough. Okay, so, uh, so, we can combine the last two, th two theorems. So if we combine Balogsemiridic hours with this theorem, because Balogsemiridic hours tells you that if the additive energy is large, there is a subset which has small subset. But if you have a subset which has small subset, then you apply this theorem. And so how this explain why Balogsemiridic theorem is useful? It's easier to prove things about small subset than about large additive energy. So, so another way of thinking about it is that additive energy is an L2 concept, but, but looking at cardinalities is more like L1. So it goes from an L2 problem to L1 in the context where L1 is much easier to work with than L2. Okay, so, okay, this will be more technical unfortunately, but let me now say something that I proved and it's basically combining the previous two results but looking at the asymmetric version of value semiotic hours which I didn't state. So, it is quite technical, but let me just give you the idea. So now we have two measures which are finally supported, but first of all, they don't have to be indicator functions. So it's very easy to go from indicator functions to non-indicator functions just by pigeonholing. But the, the main difference is that they are, could be totally different, totally different size, totally different everything. So we have two measures, probability. Probability measures supported on a finite set because everything lives, everything lives in some space with two to the m elements. So these are finite measures. Okay, and now we have some Q, which is between one and infinity strictly. This is com so this theorem is completely false for Q either equal one or infinity, as you would expect. Okay, so suppose that we convolve these two measures and there is almost no gain in smoothness measured by the LQ norm and where the gain is exponential. Suppose we do not have an exponential gain of smoothness measured by the LQ norm. And new is a probability measure. So the opposite inequality is always true, putting a one here because we will have to put the L1 norm of nu, but it is one because that is the total mass and it is one because it's a probability measure. So the opposite inequality is true with one. So the question is what happens if that trivial inequality is close to sharp? So if there is almost no gain. Okay, so then something very similar to this picture happens, except that now we have two, two measures. So somehow the picture to keep in mind is at this, so at, this, at, each, at each level of the construction, either one measure has full branching or the other has no branching. So it could be that this one has full branching, so when this one has full branching, this one could be anything. And when this has, this one has no branching, this one could be anything. Because we are looking at the subset or the convolution. So, so if you convolve Lebesgue measure or uniform measure with anything, there is no gain in smoothness because it's already Lebesgue measure. And if you convolve any measure with a single atom, there is also no gain in smoothness because we are convolving with an atom. So somehow, these are the two trivial examples where there is no smoothness convolving to different measures. And somehow the idea is that if there is no gain in smoothness, one of the two situations has to happen at each scale. But at different scales, things could switch around in complicated ways. Okay, so this is what the theorem says, but okay. 
technically it's a bit more complicated. So first of all, there are two subsets of the support of the measures. For A, the subset carries a big part of the LQ norm. So there, should, there is a Q missing here. So it should be LQ norm. So it could be that the, mass, the mu mass of A could be exponentially small. And somehow this is a difficulty in using this. It captures a big part of the LQ norm. It doesn't have to capture a big part of the mass. And for B, it does capture a big part of the mass. So we have subsets which are large in some sense. And then the measures are nearly constant. So the measures are basically indicator functions on these sets. Up to a constant, up to a constant they are up to a factor, they are constant. So mu restricted to A is essentially the indicator of A and the same for mu and B. Then we have, we have sets, so we can look at the associated trees, and they are regular in the sense that at each level the number of offspring is constant. Okay, and you, now you can forget about one, two, and three. The only thing that matters, okay, this matters, one, two, and three, but the punchline, so the really key part of the theorem is four, which says that at each stage of the construction, either the tree corresponding to A, which corresponds to mu, has almost full branching, or at that scale, the alternative is that the set corresponding to mu has no branching. So it is the idea that I explained before. Either full branching on one side or no branching on the other side. Okay, so actually this theorem is a relatively simple consequence of previous known results. Uh, so, but anyway, so here it is. So let me try to give a very, very quick flavor of why this is important in the proof uh, of the main result. So in the proof of the main result, we have measures which are, uh, by definition, infinite convolutions. So it is not so surprising that there are <coughs> convolutions involved. And also we want to show that the LQ norm of these measures is small in some sense. LQ dimension large means that the LQ norm of discrete approximations is small. So smooth, it means small LQ norm. So it is reasonable that some convolutions involved in these measures need to be smoothing, very smoothing. So this is quite uh, easy to believe. And this is really uh, somehow the key, the key thing to prove for everything to work. So don't read any of this. Uh, just look at this, so I will explain what this means. So mu x is this dynamical sort of similar measure that I introduced in the previous talks. And this m here means discrete approximation at scale two to the minus m. So I look at the measure at the finite resolution, which is two to the minus m. And what is needed is that if I convolve this with any other measure, then there is a flattening in the LQ norm. Okay, the way I said it is clearly not true because if rho is an atom, then the LQ norm doesn't change. So the only assumption is that rho, the measure that I convolve with, is not an atom. It is exponentially far from being an atom from the point of view of the LQ norm. But otherwise, I don't assume any structure on rho. And then there is a flattening of the LQ norm. And okay, this is proved using the previous theorem. And actually, proving this was the hardest part for me, but the idea is very simple. This measure is self-similar. So a self-similar measure should look the same at every scale. So it is self-similar, and it is not very large. So there is an assumption in the theorem that tells that it is not already something like Lebesgue measure. It doesn't really look like Lebesgue measure. So it cannot have full branching. Okay, somehow the branching has to be the same at every, at every scale, because it is self-similar. This is the idea. It has to be the same at every scale. And the same, this, same, this constant branching cannot be full, because if it was full, the measure mu would already be Lebesgue, and we would be happy. And then by the previous theorem says that this really needs to happen because either this, so at each scale, either this has full branching or this has no branching. But this never has full branching. So this sometimes, sorry, then this always will have no branching. But if this always has no branching, it will look like an atom. And if it looks like an atom, it will not satisfy this assumption. So this is the heuristics, the actual details as usually happens. Unfortunately, they are not so simple, but this is the heuristics of why this is true. Okay, that was all. Thank you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Q prime is Q. Uh, Q prime, okay, so it could be Q. It doesn't really matter because any power you put here, you can put here. So in the proof, it's used with, with the dual exponent, but it is irrelevant. You could put no exponent here or any exponent you want. So it is not a typo, but it's also not, not relevant. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>